Hokey dokey folkies, here we go. This is certainly a new departure in terms of my style of education or educating. But I suppose the needs of today dictate that this is what we have to do and this is what we have to do. So therefore, I think what we'll do, we normally have chemistry this time on a Friday. So what I'm gonna do is I'm simply just going to verbally reflect on what we did on the titration the last day. I don't think we got a chance to do a sample calculation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a question that I found on Study Clicks. I think it came up last year or the year before. I'm not too sure. You can find it yourselves if you go into Study Clicks and just go into questions by topic with chemistry and look up the experiments or look up water, very bottom title. And it's the first experiment that's at the top in relation to water and the calculation of hardness of water. So I'm going to go through this, bearing in mind that what we did the last day was a titration to reveal to us in parts per million and by the way, parts per million, nothing more than just milligrams per litre. So when you do your titration calculation and you get your grams per litre, you multiply by a thousand. That will give you milligrams per litre and milligrams per litre are parts per million. So you can just take milligrams per litre out, put a line through it, put PPM after it. And that's the concentration uh, of calcium in that body of water. So to keep in mind what we did. In your burette, you had a chemical called EDTA, ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. And in the conical flask, you had two 25 centimeter portions of hard water, so 50 in total. You then took a buffer solution of 10 to make sure that the environment in which this particular um, indicator was going to work was at a pH of 10. So you took a buffer solution. I know we had to use a lot of it. We didn't get a color change when it was kept at one or two centimeters cubed. We used a lot, but look, don't worry about the quantity of buffer solution. Just know that the buffer solution is needed in order to keep the medium of the conical flask at a pH of 10 so that the color change of the indicator, which we call areochrome black or solochrome black, whichever you find easier to spell, changes from that lovely wine red color in the presence of calcium into that deep royal blue when the calcium has been extracted by the EDTA. So you put your EDTA into the burette. You had your hard water in the conical flask. You had your buffer solution to bring pH 10. You added in your areochrome black and it went wine red. And then you began your titration. And as you titrated, you had to swirl the conical flask really well if the wine red was deep in order to see the change to blue. So it's a subtle change, hard to see and probably one of the ones that's most hard to do accurately. Anyway, we did it. And I think most of us got an answer in around between 20 and 30, 25 and 30 in around there. And um, you did it three times as normal, ignoring the first and the average of second two. So I'm just going to take this question here. I'm going to go through it from the point of view of a revision of what we did last day. And then I'm going to set one or two questions through Google Classroom that I want you to look at in relation to the titrations. And you may, of course, come back to me with those calculations if you have a difficulty with them. You can email me or you can send me back the work if you want me to take a look at it and correct it. Um, either way, I'm open to all of that. So that's fine. So question one, the total hardness in a water supply was estimated by titrating 50 centimeters cubed samples of water with a standard solution of EDTA, and they give you the name. The ions that cause hardness, which are represented by M2 plus. Now M2 plus just stands for calcium or magnesium. It's just a symbol. And the EDTA ions, which are represented by H2Y2 minus, again, a symbol for the complex molecule that EDTA is, react according to the following balanced equation. Now, we always love to get a balanced equation in chemistry because a balanced equation reveals the ratio that exists between the two species that we are titrating. Keeping in mind that the M2 plus is the hard water ion, so we're going to be titrating that against that. And you'll notice straight away that the ratio is one is to one. So that's all fine. The average volume of a 0 0.01 molar EDTA solution required to react with 50 centimeters cubed of the water was 9.3. So part A, identify a compound of calcium that is one of the main causes of permanent hardness in water. Now for part A, we simply have to remember that calcium or magnesium ions, so two plus and two plus, are both responsible for hardness in water. What gives permanent hardness is the presence of the sulfate radical, SO4 two minus. So this is the one that will give the permanent hardness and the temporary hardness is due to the hydrogen carbonates. And again, that would be a two minus. So you notice there that straight away, if they're asking us for a cause of permanent hardness, then we would say that the cause of permanent hardness is either calcium or magnesium sulfate. We don't have to worry about hydrocarbonates because that's temporary. Part B, 
Describe the procedure used to measure out 50 centimetres cubed of the hard water from a beaker into a conical flask. Now, 12 marks going for this, so therefore you would have to make sure that you have at least four points of information when you're dealing with this one. If you're measuring out 50 centimetres cubed of hard water from a beaker into a conical flask, the first thing you've got to remember is you're going to use a pipette and a pipette filler. So that's the first thing. So your pipette and your pipette filler. Secondly, you have to rinse the pipette through with water, then with the solution it's going to contain. So that's extremely important. Thirdly, using the pipette filler, you bring the liquid up through the pipette until the meniscus sits on the mark of the pipette. That's extremely important. And then fourthly, you would, by glass-to-glass -glass contact with the pipette at an angle, you simply press the button and you discharge the hard water into the conical flask under the force of gravity. So you don't knock out the last drop, you just let it go in by itself as long as you maintain glass-to-glass -glass contact. Part C. Name the indicator added to the conical flask. Now for this there are two types. There's two brand names I suppose. It's the same chemical but there's two brand names and you can decide which one you want to use. One is called Solochrome Black and the other one is called Aerochrome Black. Okay, so you can decide whichever one of those you want to use yourself. That's fine. Probably easier to spell the Solochrome Black than it is the Aerochrome Black. Okay. Then it says, what colour was observed when using this indicator in the presence of M2 plus? Now remember that M2 plus is the hard water ion. We have a beautiful wine red colour. That's the key thing. It's wine red. So it goes from a lovely wine red into a kind of a royal blue. Excuse my handwriting now, but this is all new to me. <laughs> now, and then it says, what's the colour at the end point? Well, there you go. There's your change. So you've got wine red. And then you've got a royal blue. So nine marks to that. Part D. A small volume of another solution was added to the water samples before commencing the titration. Identify this solution. That's obviously your buffer solution. So that's where you put in the buffer. Buffer solution. And the buffer solution is needed because we want to maintain a medium of a pH 10. So we want to make sure that the pH is 10 in that particular flask. Part E, and this is where the calculations begin, so I'm going to slow down and do this carefully. First of all, calculate the average number of moles of EDTA used in the titrations. Now, they're asking this in a slightly different way. Normally we'd launch into V1, M1 over N1 equals V2, M2 over N2, but they're kind of doing this a slightly different way. And if you follow it, the answer comes out as being exactly the same. So let's just take, first of all, the average number of moles of EDTA used in the titrations. Now, if you go back up here, you'll see in this sentence that the average, the 0.1 molar, 0.01 molar EDTA solution was 9.3. So in there, you'll see that the EDTA is 0 0.01 molar, but we only use 9.3 centimeters cubed of it. So just to make a note of that, 0 0.01 molar EDTA. Now, what does that actually mean? That means that if you had one liter, you would have 0 0.01 moles. But guess what? We didn't take a thousand centimeters cubed. Go back and look at what's highlighted. We only used 9.3 centimeters cubed. And if my calculations are correct, if we use 9.3 centimeters cubed of a 0 0.01 molar solution, that gives me 9.3 by 10 to the power of minus 5 moles. And we're always going to expect something very, very small because we're dealing with calcium in water, which is a natural phenomenon and therefore will be sparingly present in there. So the numbers in this titration will be quite small. Now, if you're wondering how I did that, the way in which we, I you normally do it is if 0 0.01 molar is in a litre and I want to find out how much is in 9.3, I would cross multiply these two. Cross multiply the 0 0.01 by the 9.3 and then divide by the 1000. That's how you get your 9.3 by 10 to the power of minus 5. Now, part 2 of E. The number of moles of M2 plus ions in 50 centimetres cubed of hard water. Now we did already up here, if we go back to our balanced equation, we already said from the balanced equation that we noticed that there was a one-to-one -one relationship between the hard water ions and the EDTA. So therefore, if it took 9.3 centimetres cubed in order to take all the calcium out of 50 centimetres cubed of the hard water, 
and the ratio is 1 is to 1, that means that we also have 9.3 by 10 to the power of minus 5 moles of calcium, or hard water ions, I suppose we want to put it down as a question, as M2 plus, in the 50 centimetres cubed of water that we used. Okay, now, question asks us then, part 3, what's the total hardness of the water expressed in grams per litre? So now what I've got to go first of all is to moles per litre, then I've got to go to grams per litre. But you notice that they are blaming all the hardness in water on calcium carbonate. Even though calcium carbonate doesn't get into the water supply, they blame all the hardness in calcium carbonate. So we use this question as if calcium carbonate was the sole chemical responsible for hard water. So part three says that they want to work out the number of the total hardness of water expressed in grams per litre. Now, if it's CaCO3, I need to turn 9.3 by 10 to the minus 5 moles of CaCO3 in 50 centimetres cubed up into grams per litre. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to moles per litre. So if I want to go to moles per litre, I'm going to multiply that by 20, and that will bring it up to the 1 litre, which means I multiply this by 20 to bring it up to the number of moles present in 1 litre. And when I do that and multiply it by 20, I end up getting 1.86 by 10 to the power of minus 3 moles per litre. Now I want to go to grams per litre. So I want to find out, first of all, how heavy is CaCO3. And if I go to my periodic table, calcium is 40, carbon is 12, and 3 oxygens is 48. So altogether that's 100. 48. Altogether that's 100. So therefore I'm going to multiply this by 100 to go to grams per litre. And if I do that, that's going to bring it down to 0 0.186 grams per litre of the CaCO3. But then we're told that we've got to take the total hardness of water expressed as parts per million. And now they're very nicely here because, look, they tell you in this question, look at that, milligrams per litre. So they actually give you the milligrams per litre. So therefore, they're telling you what to do. You further multiply that by 1,000, which will then tell you that it's 186 milligrams per liter which is better known as 186 parts per million okay so the last part then part f suggest a way to determine if this water supply contained temporary hardness now the key word there is temporary and we said already at the beginning that if something contains temporary hardness that means it's only there while the water is cold as soon as you heat the water the hardness disappears and the reason for that is because in temporary hardness, the radical that is responsible for temporary hardness is a hydrogen carbonate. So therefore, what do we do in order to get rid of hydrogen carbonates? We heat them. And when we heat them, they turn back in to H2O and to CO2. So therefore, suggest a way to determine if this water supply contained temporary hardness? Boil it. So what you would do is you take your sample, you'd boil your sample, then you would run your titration again and you'd look to see if the parts per million, which in this case were 186 parts per million, if that drops and it drops significantly, then most of your water contained um, temporary hardness. If you were to take that sample, to boil it and to do the titration again, and there was no change in the hardness, that means that all the hardness was permanent and therefore could only be removed by what we would call ion exchange resin. OK, so look, I hope that's been of help. That's the question run through. It's about 15 minutes of question run through. So if you go to Google Classroom now, I've set up another question there that I want you to take a look at. And uh, if you have any difficulties with that particular titration question, you may come back to me. I will also be setting some questions out of the textbook as well. Um, and I'll throw them up in Google Classroom. Any questions, no problem. Email. Take care.